Chapter 7 of The Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hour of the Dragon, Chapter 7 The Rending of the Veil. Conan knew his only chance of escape lay in speed. He did not even consider hiding somewhere near Belverus until the chase passed on. He was certain that the uncanny ally of Tarascus would be able to ferret him out. Besides, he was not one to skulk and hide. An open fight or an open chase either suited his temperament better. He had a long start, he knew. He would lead them a grinding race for the border. Zenobia had chosen well in selecting the white horse. His speed, toughness, and endurance were obvious. The girl knew weapons and horses, and Conan reflected with some satisfaction she knew men. He rode westward at a gate that ate up the miles. It was a sleeping land through which he rode, past grove-sheltered villages and white-walled villas amid spacious fields and orchards that grew sparser as he fared westward. As the villages thinned, the land grew more rugged, and the keeps that frowned from eminences told of centuries of border war. But none rode down from those castles to challenge or halt him. The lords of the keeps were following the banner of Amalric. The pennons that were wont to wave over these towers were now floating over the Aquilonian plains. When the last huddled village fell behind him, Conan left the road, which was beginning to bend toward the northwest, toward the distant passes. To keep to the road would mean to pass by border towers, still garrisoned with armed men who would not allow him to pass unquestioned. He knew there would be no patrols riding the border marches on either side, as in ordinary times, but there were those towers, with dawn there would probably be cavalcades of returning soldiers with wounded men in ox-carts. This road from Belverus was the only road that crossed the border for fifty miles from north to south. It followed a series of passes through the hills, and on either hand lay a wide expanse of wild, sparsely inhabited mountains. He maintained his due westerly direction, intending to cross the border deep in the wilds of the hills that lay to the south of the passes. It was a shorter route, more arduous, but safer for a hunted fugitive. One man on a horse could traverse country an army would find impassable. But at dawn he had not reached the hills. They were a long, low blue rampart stretching along the horizon ahead of him. Here there were neither farms nor villages, no white-walled villas looming among clustering trees. The dawn wind stirred the tall, stiff grass, and there was nothing but the long rolling swells of brown earth covered with dry grass, and in the distance the gaunt walls of a stronghold on a low hill. Too many Aquilonian raiders had crossed the mountains in not too distant days for the countryside to be thickly settled as it was farther to the east. Dawn ran like a prairie fire across the grasslands, and high overhead sounded a weird crying as a straggling wedge of wild geese winged swiftly southward. In a grassy swale, Conan halted and unsaddled his mount. Its sides were heaving, its coat plastered with sweat. He had pushed it unmercifully through the hours before dawn. While it munched the brittle grass and rolled, he lay at the crest of the low slope, staring eastward. Far away to the northward he could see the road he had left, streaming like a white ribbon over a distant rise. No black dots moved along that glistening ribbon. There was no sign about the castle in the distance to indicate that the keepers had noticed the lone wayfarer. An hour later the land still stretched bare. The only sign of life was a glint of steel on the far-off battlements, a raven in the sky that wheeled backward and forth, dipping and rising, as if seeking something. Conan saddled and rode westward at a more leisurely gait. As he topped the farther crest of the slope, a raucous screaming burst out over his head, and looking up he saw the raven flapping high above him, cawing incessantly. As he rode on it followed him, 
maintaining its position and making the morning hideous with its strident cries, heedless of his efforts to drive it away. This kept up for hours until Conan's teeth were on edge, and he felt that he would give half his kingdom to be allowed to wring that black neck. "'Devils of hell!' he roared in futile rage, shaking his mailed fist at the frantic bird. "'Why do you harry me with your squawking? Begone, you black spawn of perdition, and peck for wheat in the farmer's fields!' He was ascending the first pitch of the hills, and he seemed to hear an echo of the bird's clamor far behind him. Turning in his saddle, he presently made out another black dot hanging in the blue. Beyond that again, he caught the glint of the afternoon sun on steel. That could mean only one thing, armed men. And they were not riding along the beaten road, which was out of his sight beyond the horizon. They were following him. His face grew grim, and he shivered slightly as he stared at the raven that wheeled high above him. "'So, it is more than the whim of a brainless beast,' he muttered. "'Those riders cannot see you, spawn of hell, but the other bird can see you, and they can see him. You follow me, he follows you, and they follow him. Are you only a craftily trained feathered creature, or some devil in the form of a bird?' Did Zaltotun set you on my trail? Are you Zaltotun? Only a strident screech answered him, a screech vibrating with harsh mockery. Conan wasted no more breath on his dusky betrayer. Grimly, he settled to the long grind of the hills. He dared not push the horse too hard. The rest he had allowed it had not been enough to freshen it. He was still far ahead of his pursuers, but they would cut down that lead steadily. It was almost a certainty that their horses were fresher than his, for they had undoubtedly changed mounts at that castle he had passed. The growing grew rougher, the scenery more rugged, steep grassy slopes pitching up to densely timbered mountainsides. Here, he knew, he might elude his hunters, but for that hellish bird that squalled incessantly above him. He could no longer see them in this broken country, but he was certain that they still followed him, guided unerringly by their feathered allies. That black shape became like a demoniac incubus, hounding him through measureless hells. The stones he hurled with a curse went wide or fell harmless, though in his youth he had felled hawks on the wing. The horse was tiring fast. Conan recognized the grim finality of his position. He sensed an inexorable driving fate behind all this. He could not escape. He was as much a captive as he had been in the pits of Belverus. But he was no son of the Orient to yield passively to what seemed inevitable. If he could not escape, he would at least take some of his foes into eternity with him. He turned into a wide thicket of larches that massed a slope, looking for a place to turn at bay. Then, ahead of him, there rang a strange, shrill scream, human, yet weirdly timbered. An instant later, he had pushed through a screen of branches and saw the source of that eldritch cry. In a small glade below him, four soldiers in the Median chainmail were binding a noose about the neck of a gaunt old woman in peasant garb. A heap of faggots, bound with cord on the ground nearby, showed what her occupation had been when surprised by these stragglers. Conan felt slow fury swell his heart as he looked silently down and saw the ruffians dragging her toward a tree, whose low-spreading branches were obviously intended to act as a gibbet. He had crossed the frontier an hour ago. He was standing on his own soil, watching the murder of one of his own subjects. The old woman was struggling with surprising strength and energy, and as he watched, she lifted her head and voiced again the strange, weird, far-carrying call he had heard before. It was echoed as if in mockery by the raven flapping above the trees. The soldiers laughed roughly, and one struck her in the mouth. Conan swung from his weary steed and dropped down the face of the rocks, landing with a clang of mail on the grass. The four men wheeled at the sound and drew their swords, 
gaping at the mailed giant who faced them, sword in hand. Conan laughed harshly. His eyes were bleak as flint. Dogs, he said without passion and without mercy. Do Nemedian jackals set themselves up as executioners and hang my subjects at will? First, you must take the head of their king. Here I stand, awaiting your lordly pleasure. The soldier stared at him uncertainly as he strode toward them. Who is this madman? growled a bearded ruffian. He wears Nemedian mail, but speaks with an Aquilonian accent. No matter, quoth another. Cut him down, and then we'll hang the old hag. And so saying, he ran at Conan, lifting his sword. But before he could strike, the king's great blade lashed down, splitting helmet and skull. The man fell before him, but the others were hardy rogues. They gave tongue like wolves and surged about the lone figure in the gray mail, and the clamor and din of steel drowned the cries of the circling raven. Conan did not shout. His eyes coals of blue fire, and his lips smiling bleakly, he lashed right and left with his two-handed sword. For all his size, he was quick as a cat on his feet, and he was constantly in motion, presenting a moving target so that thrusts and swings cut empty air oftener than not. Yet when he struck, he was perfectly balanced, and his blows fell with devastating power. Three of the four were down, dying in their own blood, and the fourth was bleeding from half a dozen wounds, stumbling in headlong retreat as he parried frantically, when Conan's spur caught in the surcoat of one of the fallen men. The king stumbled, and before he could catch himself the Nemedian, with the frenzy of desperation, rushed him so savagely that Conan staggered and fell sprawling over the corpse. The Nemedian croaked in triumph and sprang forward, lifting his great sword with both hands over his right shoulder as he braced his legs wide for the stroke, and then, over the prostrate king, something huge and hairy shot like a thunderbolt full on the soldier's breast, and his yelp of triumph changed to a shriek of death. Conan, scrambling up, saw the man lying dead with his throat torn out, and a great gray wolf stood over him head sunk as it smelled the blood that formed a pool on the grass. Turned as the old woman spoke to him. She stood straight and tall before him, and in spite of her ragged garb, her features, clear-cut and aquiline and her keen black eyes, were not those of a common peasant woman. She called to the wolf and it trotted to her side like a great dog and rubbed its giant shoulder against her knee while it gazed at Conan with great green lambent eyes. Absently she laid her hand upon its mighty neck, and so the two stood regarding the king of Aquilonia. He found their steady gaze disquieting, though there was no hostility in it. Men say King Conan died beneath the stones and dirt when the cliffs crumbled by Valkia, she said in a deep, strong, resonant voice. So they say, he growled. He was in no mood for controversy, and he thought of those armored riders who were pushing nearer every moment. The raven above him cawed stridently, and he cast an involuntary glare upward, grinding his teeth in a spasm of nervous irritation. Up on the ledge the white horse stood with drooping head. The old woman looked at it and then at the raven and then she lifted a strange weird cry as she had before. As if recognizing the call, the raven wheeled, suddenly mute, and raced eastward. But before it had got out of sight, the shadow of mighty wings fell across it. An eagle soared up from the tangle of trees, and rising above it, swooped and struck the black messenger to the earth. The strident voice of betrayal was stilled forever. Crom muttered Conan, staring at the old woman. Are you a magician, too? I am Zaleta, she said. The people of the valleys call me a witch. Was that child of the night guiding armed men on your trail? Aye. She did not seem to think the answer fantastic. They cannot be far behind me. Lead your horse and follow me, King Conan, she said briefly. 
Without comment, he mounted the rocks and brought his horse down to the glade by a circuitous path. As he came, he saw the eagle reappear, dropping lazily down from the sky and rest an instant on Zaleda's shoulder, spreading its great wings lightly so as not to crush her with its weight. Without a word, she led the way, the great wolf trotting at her side, the eagle soaring above her. Through deep thickets and along tortuous ledges, poised over deep ravines she led him, and finally, along a narrow precipice-edged path to a curious dwelling of stone, half hut, half cavern, beneath a cliff hidden among the gorges and crags. The eagle flew to the pinnacle of this cliff and perched there like a motionless sentinel. Still silent, Zaleda stabled the horse in a nearby cave, with leaves and grass piled high for provender, and a tiny spring bubbling in the dim recesses. In the hut she seated the king on a rude, hide-covered bench, and she herself sat upon a low stool before the tiny fireplace, while she made a fire of tamarisk chunks and prepared a frugal meal. The great wolf drowsed beside her, facing the fire, his huge head sunk on his paws, his ears twitching in his dreams. "'You do not fear to sit in the hut of a witch?' she asked, breaking her silence at last. An impatient shrug of his grey-mailed shoulders was her guest's only reply. She gave into his hands a wooden dish heaped with dried fruits, cheese, and barley bread, and a great pot of heady upland beer, brewed from barley grown in the high valleys. I have found the brooding silence of the glens more pleasing than the babble of city streets, she said. The children of the wild are kinder than the children of men. Her hand briefly stroked the ruff of the sleeping wolf. My children were afar from me today, or I had not needed your sword, my king. They were coming at my call. What grudge had these Nemedian dogs against you? Conan demanded. Skulkers from the invading army straggle all over the countryside, from the frontier to Tarantia, she answered. The foolish villagers in the valleys told them that I had a store of gold hidden away, so as to divert their attentions from their villages. They demanded treasure from me, and my answers angered them. But neither skulkers, nor the men who pursue you, nor any raven will find you here. He shook his head, eating ravenously. I'm for Tarantia. She shook her head. You thrust your head into the dragon's jaws. Best seek refuge abroad. The heart is gone from your kingdom. What do you mean? he demanded. Battles have been lost before, yet wars won. A kingdom is not lost by a single defeat. And you will go to Tarantia? Aye. Prospero will be holding it against Amalric. Are you sure? Hell's devils, woman! he exclaimed wrathfully. What else? She shook her head. I feel that it is otherwise. Let us see. Not lightly is the veil rent. Yet I will rend it a little and show you your capital city. Conan did not see what she cast upon the fire, but the wolf whimpered in his dreams and a green smoke gathered and billowed up into the hut. And as he watched, the walls and ceiling of the hut seemed to widen, to grow remote and vanish, merging with infinite immensities. The smoke rolled about him, blotting out everything, and in it forms moved and faded, and stood out in startling clarity. He stared at the familiar towers and streets of Tarantia, where a mob seethed and screamed, and at the same time he was somehow able to see the banners of Nemedia moving inexorably westward through the smoke and flame of a pillaged land. In the great square of Tarantia the frantic throng milled and yammered, screaming that the king was dead, that the barons were girding themselves to divide the land between them, and that the rule of a king, even of Valerius, was better than anarchy. Prospero, shining in his armor, rode among them, trying to pacify them, bidding them trust Count Trocero, urging them to man the wall and aid his knights in defending the city. They turned on him, shrieking with fear and unreasoning rage, howling that he was Trocero's butcher, 
a more evil foe than a Malric himself. Awful and stones were hurled at his knights. A slight blurring of the picture, that might have denoted a passing of time, and then Conan saw Prospero and his knights filing out of the gates and spurring southward. Behind him the city was in an uproar. "'Fools!' muttered Conan thickly. "'Fools! Why could they not trust Prospero? Zaleta, if you are making game of me with some trickery—' "'This has passed,' answered Zaleta imperturbably, though somberly. It was the evening of the day that has passed when Prospero rode out of Tarantia, with the hosts of Amalric almost within sight. From the walls men saw the flame of their pillaging. So I read it in the smoke. At sunset the Nemedians rode into Tarantia unopposed. Look, even now in the royal hall of Tarantia. Abruptly Conan was looking into the great coronation hall. Valerius stood on the regal dais, clad in ermine robes, and Amalric, still in his dusty, blood-stained armor, placed a rich and gleaming circlet on his yellow locks, the crown of Aquilonia. The people cheered. Long lines of steel-clad Nemedian warriors looked grimly on, and nobles long in disfavor at Conan's court strutted and swaggered with the emblem of Valerius on their sleeves. Crom. It was an explosive imprecation from Conan's lips as he started up, his great fists clenched into hammers, his veins on his temples nodding, his features convulsed. A Nemedian placing the crown of Aquilonia on that renegade in the royal hall of Tarentia. As if dispelled by his violence, the smoke faded, and he saw Zaleda's black eyes gleaming at him through the mist. You have seen... The people of your capital have forfeited the freedom you want for them by sweat and blood. They have sold themselves to the slavers and the butchers. They have shown that they do not trust their destiny. Can you rely upon them for the winning back of your kingdom? They thought I was dead, he grunted, recovering some of his poise. I have no son. Men can't be governed by a memory. What if the Nemedians have taken Tarantia? There still remain the provinces, the barons, and the people of the countrysides. Valerius has won an empty glory. You are stubborn, as befits a fighter. I cannot show you the future. I cannot show you all the past. Nay, I show you nothing. I merely make you see windows open in the veil by powers unguessed. Would you look into the past for a clue of the present? I he seated himself abruptly. Again the green smoke rose and billowed. Again images unfolded before him, this time alien and seemingly irrelevant. He saw great towering black walls, pedestals half-hidden in the shadows upholding images of hideous, half-bestial gods. Men moved in the shadows, dark, wiry men, clad in red, silken loincloths. They were bearing a green jade sarcophagus along a gigantic black corridor. But before he could tell much about what he saw, the scene shifted. He saw a cavern, dim, shadowy, and haunted, with a strange, intangible horror. On an altar of black stone stood a curious golden vessel, shaped like the shell of a scallop. Into this cavern came some of the dark, wiry men who had borne the mummy case, they seized the golden vessel, and then the shadow swirled around them, and what happened he could not say. But he saw a glimmer in a whirl of darkness, like a ball of living fire. Then the smoke was only smoke, drifting up from the fire of tamarisk chunks, thinning and fading. "'But what does this portend?' he demanded, bewildered. "'What I saw in Tarantia I can understand.' But what means this glimpse of Zamorian thieves sneaking through a subterranean temple of Set in Stygia? And that cavern, I have never seen or heard anything like it, in all my wanderings. If you can show me that much, these shreds of vision which mean nothing, disjointed, why can you not show me all that is to occur? Zaleta stirred the fire without replying. 
these things are governed by immutable laws, she said at last. I cannot make you understand. I do not altogether understand myself, though I have sought wisdom in the silences of the high places for more years than I can remember. I cannot save you, though I would if I might. Man must, at last, work out his own salvation. Yet, perhaps, wisdom may come to me in dreams, and in the morn I may be able to give you the clue to the enigma. What enigma? he demanded. The mystery that confronts you, whereby you have lost a kingdom, she answered. And then she spread a sheepskin upon the floor before the hearth. Sleep, she said briefly. Without a word, he stretched himself upon it, and sank into restless but deep sleep through which phantoms moved silently and monstrous shapeless shadows crept. Once, limbed against a purple sunless horizon, he saw the mighty walls and towers of a great city, such as rose nowhere on waking earth he knew. Its colossal pylons and purple minarets lifted toward the stars and over it, floating like a giant mirage, hovered the bearded countenance of the man Zaltotun. Conan woke in the chill whiteness of early dawn, to see Zaleda crouched beside the tiny fire. He had not awakened once in the night, and the sound of the great wolf leaving or entering should have roused him. Yet the wolf was there, beside the hearth, with its shaggy coat wet with dew, and with more than dew. Blood glistened wetly amid the thick fell, and there was a cut upon his shoulder. Zaleda nodded, without looking around, as if reading the thoughts of her royal guest. He has hunted before dawn, and red was the hunting. I think the man who hunted a king will hunt no more, neither man nor beast. Conan stared at the great beast with strange fascination, as he moved to take the foods Zaleda offered him. When I come to my throne again, I won't forget, he said briefly. You've befriended me. By Crom, I can't remember when I've lain down and slept at the mercy of man or woman as I did last night. But what of the riddle you would read me this morn? A long silence ensued in which the crackle of the tamarisks was loud on the hearth. Find the heart of your kingdom, she said at last. There lies your defeat and your power. You fight more than mortal man. You will not press the throne again unless you find the heart of your kingdom. Do you mean the city of Tarantia? She shook her head. I am but oracle, through whose lips the gods speak. My lips are sealed by them lest I speak too much. You must find the heart of your kingdom. I can say no more. My lips are opened and sealed by the gods. Dawn was still white on the peaks when Conan rode westward. A glance back showed him Zaleda standing in the door of her hut, inscrutable as ever, the great wolf beside her. A gray sky arched overhead, and a moaning wind was chilled with a promise of winter. Brown leaves fluttered slowly down from the bare branches, sifting upon his mailed shoulders. All day he pushed through the hills, avoiding roads and villages. Toward nightfall he began to drop down from the heights, tier by tier, and saw the broad plains of Aquilonia spread out beneath him. Villages and farms lay close to the foot of the hills on the western side of the mountains, for, for half a century, most of the raiding across the frontier had been done by the Aquilonians. But now only embers and ashes showed where farm huts and villas had stood. In the gathering darkness, Conan rode slowly on. There was little fear of discovery, which he dreaded from friend as well as from foe. The Nemedians had remembered old scores on their westward drive, and Valerius had made no attempt to restrain his allies. He did not count on winning the love of the common people. A vast swath of desolation had been cut through the country from the foothills westward. Conan cursed as he rode over blackened expanses that had been rich fields, and saw the gaunt gable ends of burned houses jutting against the sky. 
He moved through an empty and deserted land, like a ghost out of a forgotten and outworn past. The speed with which the army had traversed the land showed what little resistance it had encountered. Yet, had Conan been leading his Aquilonians, the invading army would have been forced to buy every foot they gained with their blood. The bitter realization permeated his soul. He was not the representative of a dynasty. He was only a lone adventurer. Even the drop of dynastic blood Valerius boasted had more hold on the minds of men than the memory of Conan and the freedom and power he had given the kingdom. No pursuers followed him down out of the hills. He watched for wandering or returning Nemedian troops, but met none. Skulkers gave him a wide path, supposing him to be one of the conquerors, what of his harness. Groves and rivers were far more plentiful on the western side of the mountains, and coverts for concealment were not lacking. So he moved across the pillaged land, halting only to rest his horse, eating frugally of the foods Aleda had given him, until, on a dawn when he lay hidden on a river bank where willows and oaks grew thickly, he glimpsed afar, across the rolling plains dotted with rich groves, the blue and golden towers of Tarantia. He was no longer in a deserted land, but one teeming with varied life. His progress thenceforth was slow and cautious, through thick woods and unfrequented byways. It was dusk when he reached the plantation of Servius Galanus. End of chapter 7